The fairy tale inspired plain of Eldraine has two distinct regions. The realm, a massive and civilized kingdom ruled by humans, and the wilds, a dense, mystical forest that is home to the elves and other fair folk of the plain. The topic of this video is the realm, which is further divided into five courts, each with their own virtue, lands, and alignment of mana. The courts rule within their lands but offer fealty to High King Algonus Kenrith, who presides over all the realm from his throne in Ardenvale. Castle Ardenvale stands as a defensive bastion among the plains and hills of the Ardenvale region, and it is the seat of the High King Kenrith who rules alongside his wife, Queen Linden. The coat of arms of Ardenvale is a golden circle surrounded by silver flames meant to symbolize the circle of loyalty, and it is worn by Ardenvale knights with pride. One of five ancient artifacts on Eldraine that are said to predate even the elves, the Circle of Loyalty sits in a room atop the castle's tallest spire where its fire burns indefinitely. Those who seek to achieve knighthood in Ardenvale must walk into and through the Circle of Loyalty, whose flames can read the faithfulness and intentions of the soul. An aspirant who walks through unscathed is wrapped in shining silver flame, deemed true of heart and worthy of knighthood. If the flames sense wavering loyalty or ulterior motives, they burn the aspirant. Any who fail are saved, but rarely get to attempt the challenge again. If we pull up the Circle of Loyalty, we can see in the mechanics of the card how in tune with its lore it is. Ardenvale and the Circle itself are more powerful with more soldiers, and grant their power to those who rally under their banner. I really like how it can make knight tokens, which symbolizes its judgment of a worthy aspirant into knighthood, granting you a creature token. In Worthy Knight, we see an individual crossing the Circle of Loyalty and emerging wrapped in brilliant silver wisps. They are now able to rally citizens to their cause. But merely walking through the flame doesn't grant one knighthood. They must still make their vows by reciting the Silver Flame ritual. Once complete, they are now part of a tight-knit community of knights who give each other strength. Since loyalty is the highest virtue in Ardenvale, those who break their vows are no longer worthy of knighthood. Judgment from the Circle is quick which silences their voices, no longer allowing them to make and potentially break future vows. Knights of Ardenvale are able to call on the power of the Circle of Loyalty in dire situations. They can use its calming and uniting power to buoy morale of those around them in Rally for the Throne, or they can call on it to fulfill a vow of great duty as is showcased in Righteousness, where Sir Damon is given enough strength in his sword to cut down the dragon that ended so many lives. Ardenvale is a place of peace and unity, strengthened by its connection to white mana. Its circle of loyalty grants knighthood to those who are deemed worthy, and they carry out their vows with unshakable will. Most knights ride gallant horses, majestic unicorns, or soar through the skies on the backs of griffins to keep the realm safe from the ever-present danger of the wilds. The region of Vantress is adjacent to the lands of Ardenvale and those of Garenbrig. Pastures slowly transition to misty marsh flats and floodplains that open up to the massive Lake of Lochmere. The Castle of Vantress sits as an island atop the glassy waters of the lake, whose depth is impossible to determine from above, and it is home to the inquisitive minds of the lore mages and knights of Vantress. To reach the castle, one must either brave the waters and swim across, or make a plea for the aid of the merfolk denizens by offering secrets they've not heard before. Vantress is led by the mysterious Magic Mirror, although most of its people follow the guidance and leadership of the Archmage Gadwick the Wizened. The coat of arms of Vantress is a blue keyhole, and it is the symbol of their virtue knowledge. The people of Vantress believe knowledge to be a skeleton key, capable of unlocking all the secrets of the world. Vantress knights and lore mages are obsessed with gathering knowledge and studying the unknown often spending months within the great libraries reading endless folios in their search for answers. In fact, the Knights of Vantress frequently quest into the wilds not to fight monstrous beasts, but rather to trade with the fair folk for their secrets. Secrets are the cornerstone of life in Vantress, due in large part to its mystical artifact, the Magic Mirror. The mirror, named Indralon, sits in a water-filled basin in the foundation of the castle. It is said to be the essence of an ancient sage whose knowledge was near infinite. One day, the sage was asked a question of the world by the clumsiest goblin. But the question stumped the sage, 
who spent the rest of his life ruminating on it and trying to find the answer. Eventually he passed, but his essence lingered, unable to leave until it found the answer to the goblin's question. It was given form and became the magic mirror. Many come to Indralon with questions, and the mirror gives answers for a price. To speak with Indralon, one must divulge a secret to the mirror that it has not heard before, and in turn, it'll grant visions of the answers on its glassy facade. The card Mirror Maid exemplifies this perfectly, whose flavor text reads, Share your darkest secret, and the mirror will reveal your soul's essence. The card, the magic mirror, costs less mana to cast for each instant and sorcery in your graveyard, and I think this is meant to symbolize the knowledge you've given to speak to it. In turn, it grants you knowledge by giving you a limitless hand size, as well as giving you more cards on your upkeep. To become a knight of Vantress, one must speak to the mirror and share its devotion to seeking out the truth of the world. Vantress knights are discerning and wise, they know their enemies and they know their weaknesses. They can be seen riding giant owls or majestic unicorns. When not questing in the wilds, you'll find most with their noses and folios and tomes of their libraries. Travel alongside the roads and causeways of the realm, and you'll likely catch sight of an enormous fortress on the horizon, seemingly suspended on gathering storm clouds. This isn't a trick of light, it's Castle Loch Thwain, the black aligned court of the realm. Centuries ago, the elven kingdoms ruled Eldraine. After the rise of humans, most of the fair folk retreated to the wilds, but Queen Ayara, the elf leader of Loch Thwain, decided to remain within the realm and pledge a tentative alliance with the humans to retain her lands. The virtue of Loch Thwain is persistence, and its knights are famed for their tenacity. If we take a look at the flavor text of Bell of the Brawl and Lost Legion, we see that warriors of Loch Thwain are always the last ones standing. The coat of arms of Loch Thwain is that of a golden goblet on the background of purple and black, and it symbolizes the famed Cauldron of Eternity. We can see the symbol of the cauldron on many of the clothes and pieces of armor worn by the people of Loch Thwain with pride. The leader of Loch Thwain is the elf, Queen Ayara. She's old, far older than even the long-lived elves, and many believe her to be immortal, which would make sense given that she is the steward of the Cauldron of Eternity. Still, others believe that it is her pure perseverance that keeps her alive, and that she is the paragon of Loch Thwain's virtue. Regardless of what you choose to believe, she is a wise and powerful ruler. We can see her standing on a balcony with a man kneeling behind her, offering himself to her. Her flavor text reads, Mourning shifts seamlessly to celebration as she chooses her next suitor. No doubt this is the next suitor in line. It would seem that Ayara goes through many suitors and spouses, given cards like Festive Funeral and Smitten Swordmaster. But why? Ayara has been missing her Cauldron of Eternity, for generations in fact, with no inkling of finding it. And so it is the most honorable quest of perseverance to seek out the Cauldron and return it home to her. She finds a capable and willing champion, marries them, and then sends them out to the wilds in search of the artifact after which she waits a year and one day. If they don't return, and they never do, she considers them dead and marries the next champion in line. The Cauldron of Eternity, one of the five ancient artifacts of Eldraine, is a massive stone chalice with a metallic inside large enough to hold a human body within, and it grants immortality to those who take drink from it. This is observed most clearly in the card Forever Young, whose art and text hints at everlasting life. The cauldron can also resurrect the fallen whom it has deemed worthy, which is seen in the card Cauldron's Gift, which returns a fallen creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. If we take a look at the card itself, you'll notice it has a steep casting cost, requiring great perseverance to cast, although that is reduced by two for each brave knight that has fallen while questing for it. While on the battlefield, it ensures that none of your creatures die for good, sending them instead to your library. It also has the ability to return to life those that fell before. And this is such a great flavor win for a powerful card. The cauldron was housed in Castle Loch Thwain, but disappeared centuries ago. It is said that the ancient artifacts tether the five courts of the realm, both figuratively and literally. And so it would make sense that the tether was severed after the cauldron's disappearance, casting Loch Thwain to the skies, unable to rest until it is found. 
It wasn't until the events of the Wildered Quest that the cauldron resurfaced, brought into existence by Will Kenrith's unstoppable perseverance in saving Garrick Wildspeaker from Dark Murfolk, nearly to the point of his own death. Although he was unable to keep the great hunter alive, he pushed the man's body into the cauldron who spoke with a voice that squeezed the heart and deemed Garrick worthy. Its power resurrected him and broke him from his curse. As mysteriously as it appeared, it again vanished into oblivion. Venture through the tortuous mountain paths to the city of Embrith and you'll quickly realize that the red-aligned court of the realm lacks a true castle. Rather, Embrith refers to its entire surrounding free city, and it is ruled not by a queen or king, but a council of knights and nobles. The dwarf Torbran, Thane of Redfell, is not technically a resident of Embrith, but his courage in battle and frequent dealings with the townsfolk has earned him the title of noble. This court's virtue is courage, and the residents of Embrith are chock full of it. They believe nothing done without bravery can truly be considered virtuous, and with courage in one's heart, no challenge is too great. We can see this in simple cards like Thrill of Possibility, where Sarkara the Bold asks, Remember all those great heroes who were careful and never did anything risky? Me neither. They take every opportunity to test their mettle and prove their courage, which is why Embrith is home to the Burning Yard. The only structure close enough to resembling a castle in Embrith is the Burning Yard, a pitched field and tournament ground that hosts all competitions from jousting and swordplay to archery and wrestling. The yard itself is illustrated beautifully in the card tournament grounds, whose flavor text solidifies the idea that the tournaments have been going on for quite some time and that they are open to all within the realm. We get a glimpse into the life of an Emberith knight in the card Joust, where Sir Lane tells us the importance of boldness. Interestingly enough, it seems the Burning Yard also hosts creatures of the wild, seen in the card Red Cap Melee. Whether these goblins were admitted into the tournament or were captured in the wilds and brought to the tournament for entertainment is unknown, but it would align with the philosophy of Red Mana to be more progressive. The Knights of Emberth love besting their opponents on the pitch, but to truly be granted knighthood, one must face the court's mystical artifact, the Iron Crag. Beside the burning yard lies a massive and magical boulder, pulsing with red-hot energy, the Iron Crag. One of the five ancient artifacts of Eldraine, it is surprisingly the only one that didn't receive its own card in the set. Aspirants of Emberth must confront and control their fears in order to become knights. To demonstrate their resolve, they must thrust their sword into the Iron Crag, and if the stone has deemed them truly courageous, they can pull their sword back out. If it senses their fear, however, the sword will remain in the Iron Crag, forever a symbol of their failure. Emberith Myth claims that the stone even speaks to aspirants, taunting them and testing their courage. The card Iron Crag Feet illustrates this tradition beautifully. In it we see a knight thrusting her sword to the sky in triumph after having pulled it free from the stone. Beside her lay countless weapons that were unable to be removed, and behind her a rushing lava flow. Occasionally, the Iron Crag will deliver a boon to a truly powerful knight and give their weapon a legendary name, forever imbuing it with power. The card Embercleave is one such weapon, its steel covered in mystical energy. And if you look closely, you can see the Iron Crag in the background, its surface dotted with several blades. Emberth mages also draw their power from the Iron Crag and must harness their emotions to wield it to its full potential. They are masters of fire magic and the magic of fear known as Phobomancy. The final region is the remote and verdant Garenbrig, the green-aligned court of the realm. Garenbrig is mostly uncultivated lands and it borders the dangerous forests of the wild. Ruled by the giants of Eldraine, Garenbrig threw off the yoke of other rulers long ago, although their leader King Yorvo respects the word of High King Kenrith. In fact, Garenbrig is the only place in the realm that giants can be found. Most have retreated into the heart of the wilds like the rest of the fair folk. Garenbrig's virtue is strength, and its coat of arms is twin hammers shaped to represent the Great Henge, Garenbrig's ancient legendary artifact. The castle sits just below an enormous outcropping in the rocky hillside, 
Above is an assortment of ancient monoliths carefully positioned around a central rock formation, with an old yew tree growing through it. An even larger monolith rests at an angle over this arrangement of stones, collectively known as the Great Henge. It's a mystical gateway that, by changing the orientation of the obelisks around the portal, can transport an individual to any place within the wilds. It is used by King Yorvo with much discretion, and the magic of the Henge pulses throughout Garenbrig. Knights of Garenbrig are among the most physically powerful in all the realm, and although giants rule this region, many humans and other sentient species fill its ranks. They enjoy the hardships of living with nature, and seek to prove their brute strength. To become a knight of Garenbrig, one must demonstrate a great feat of strength, something beyond the capabilities expected of their size and species. Many are seen riding bears and wielding great hammers, as is the case with Sir Fairn the Hengehammer. Others are seen fighting bears, beautifully illustrated in the card Out Muscle. Knights of Garenbrig journey around the land, seeking out any challenge. Thanks for watching this breakdown of the five courts of Eldraine. Let me know which one your favorite is down in the comments. Give a thumbs up if you liked the video, and don't forget to subscribe for weekly lore content. The links to all the sources used in this video can be found in the description below. I hope you enjoyed our trip into the fairytale plain of Eldraine. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.